Hello Internet, welcome back to 80's Vampire Month and a movie that since I rewatched it a couple of nights ago I've now become mildly obsessed with 1983's The Hunger Tony Scott's directorial debut based on the novel by Whitley Stryber starring Catherine Deneuve, David Bowie and Susan Sarandon after seeing the movie I decided not only to order both box sets of the Hunger TV show, even though I know it's got absolutely nothing to do with this movie. Uh, it's produced by Tony and, and Ridley Scott. Uh, it's an anthology show. Uh, I've also uh, ordered Whitley Stryber's uh, original novel to see how that differs from the film, because I've read on the internet that the ending is specifically different. Uh, I've also ordered uh, Stryber's book, uh, The Wolfen, because that was the basis, I did not know, was the basis for Wolfen, one of my sort of favourite uh, underground, unspoken of uh, werewolf movies. So, I'm in a bit of a Whitley Stryber, The Hunger, Tony Scott type mode at the moment. Now probably one of the most well-known things, actually the second most well-known thing about this movie is the weird bizarro ending, which I'll talk about at the ending of this video. The most uh, well-known uh, thing about it is the lesbian sex scene, which we'll get to probably round about the middle of this video. Uh, but I want to start with the start of the movie. Uh, it starts with, in, a, in a goth club with Bauhaus, a short-lived English goth band singing their song Bella Lugosi's Dead. And whilst it's maybe a little on the nose now for our sensibilities, it was really the film setting out its stall right from the opening frame. The old vampires, the old modes of thinking are gone. Forget castles, forget capes, we're in the here and now and let's go. It's so 80s, it's unbelievable. You've got the club, you've got Bauhaus, you've got Bowie and De Nerve there, you've got punk goths dancing with smoke machines and neon and everything looks cool and sexy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the 80s and these are 80s vampires. Everything you knew, forget Christopher Lee, forget Bela Lugosi, let's go. There's a lot of fast intercutting, especially in the opening sequence of the movie. It, it settles down, but it's throughout the entire movie. Uh, it's got very heavy shades of Nicholas Rogue's movies, Walkabout and Don't Look Now. And I think Tony Scott's very open about the fact that he was heavily influenced by Nick Rogue and his filmmaking. And um, so there are lots of examples like Rogue uses of um, mirrored act, uh, cutting uh, between different people at the same time and, and their actions mirroring, especially Sarandon plays with her hair a lot. And there's a, uh, you get Bowie playing with his hair and then cuts to uh, her doing it, or Bowie. Uh, pulling on a cigarette and uh, quickly cutting to sound and blowing the smoke out and stuff like that. But there's also, so there's cutting across space, but there's also uh, cutting uh, quick cuts across time, reminding me a little bit of Highlander, but done for a different effect, um, where there's a sort of call and response into cutting between uh, the present day and uh, ancient Egypt or Regency France, I guess, uh, and uh, and the twentieth century, uh, it sort of it's supposed to evoke uh, the memories of the vampires, uh, but at the same time, it's almost like I say a call and response through time. Something that happened centuries ago now reflects and affects the modern day as well. If it's a style you're not particularly fond of, then you won't be particularly fond of this film. Personally, I think. The greatest effect of all this intercutting is it sort of propagates the notion of uh, whether you're in ancient Egypt, Regency France, or 20th century New York. Pretty much uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And immortality and eternal youth uh, may sound like an absolutely fantastic proposition, but after centuries and centuries and centuries of the same thing, you're going to get 
whether you're Dorian Gray on the outside, whether you look like a young David Bowie for 300 years or not, you're going to get worn down and old and tired on the inside. And these are these are very lethargic vampires. Uh, they're very cool, calm and collected. They're very in control. Catherine Deneuve is glacial, icy, she's been described as. And um, I think that's partly to do with uh, poise and confidence. These are apex predators, after all. I think it's also perhaps to do with the fact that they are languid and weary at the same time. And uh, this notion of being a... Peter Pan and constantly chasing perfection is is played out most of all with David Bowie's character uh, John Blaylock as he begins to lose it. The basic plot is very simple and I think possibly one of the reasons why this film gets accused of being style over substance. But we're in the 80s here, and the, uh, what is the 80s about if not style over substance? So I think that's something that, uh, uh, for the sake of this series of videos, we can celebrate rather than forgive. But the plot as it is, is, is very thin. Catherine Deneuve plays Miriam Blaylock, as she's known now. She's an ancient vampire, thousands of years old. We know that... Uh, she's been around at least since ancient Egypt. And to try and conquer her loneliness, she takes partners throughout the centuries. And she promises them a relationship forever and ever. An eternal youth, an eternal life. And John starts to age. He starts to age rapidly. And we find out that that promise is a promise that she's made quite a number of times before. And her consorts, her, her partners, her thralls, don't have the longevity that she does. Maybe only a few centuries, and then she has to find someone else. So, uh, this film sits in that transitional period. It's something of a... Uh, a love triangle, I guess, with her detaching herself from Bowie, Bowie coming to terms with the ramifications of that rapid ageing, like decades in the space of hours, uh, whilst he watches his partner move on and woo and lure someone else, Susan Sarandon's character, into this life. Sarandon plays a doctor who's doing... Uh, scientific studies into the aging process at the moment with monkeys as test subjects but uh, Miriam uh, first approaches her to see if any of her research can help John but then sort of becomes they become mutually fascinated with one another and John's sort of cut adrift and uh, ultimately will uh, Susan Sarandon's character Sarah accept this uh, gift of supposed immortality uh, and take at John's place and will they move happily off through the centuries together until she presumably starts to age with her and die and that's pretty much it the big kick for Miriam's partners who have basically signed up for uh, the forever and ever that she's promised is that technically she didn't lie to them they can't die it's just that when they start to age uh, they'll feel everything uh, they'll crumble down to dusty, uh, mummified zombies, but there will still be, where they won't be able to move, they'll still be able to feel and are conscious of everything. And she's got quite a little collection of X's up in her attic. <laughs> when it gets to this stage, she takes them up there and she puts them uh, in a coffin, introduces them to all of the others who are still there, and... Uh, moves on to the, to the next person and they are stuck for all eternity in these rotting shells still conscious and still able to feel but ultimately uh, abandoned and cut adrift and you have to wonder one of the things that is playing on my mind one of the main reasons I want to read the book to see how Striver deals with it is how much this is actually genuinely a concern of Miriam's, whether she is genuinely heartbroken and can't bear to part with these uh, lovers, 
or whether she kind of doesn't care and just moves on and it's maybe out of uh, vestigial guilt that she, she keeps them around. Now, this film's got all the elements of horror uh, movie in it. It's not really a traditional horror movie, I wouldn't call it. So, uh, gore hounds aren't going to like this film. They're going to think it's slow, boring and pretentious. And it does have uh, allusions to, to art house cinema. I can't help but suspect uh, Tony Scott, his first film coming from a career in, in ads, uh, ad, uh, advertisements, and a lot of the, a lot of the film looks like a glossy ad. It looks like uh, Calvin Klein perfume ads and the like. Uh, part of me wonders whether one of the reasons the movie seems to be all style and no substance is because it's the the ad man coming out making making this want to look like an art house movie or look like a Nick Rogue movie. Uh, look like something that alludes to art, but ultimately just kind of misses it. There's maybe slightly too many uh, smoke machines, too many billowing curtains and the like. But I kind of like that. I think if that's the case, uh, then the movie itself is like uh, Bowie and Deneuve, the vampires in this movie. Uh, a very, very close facsimile to human, passing as human within the human world, but not quite human, doing all the things humans maybe are supposed to do. Uh, they look human, they, they move like humans, they sound like humans, but they're not quite humans. This film looks like an art house movie, it plays like an art house movie, but it's not quite an art house movie. Um, whether that's a correct and fair reading of the film or not, it's it looks unlike any other vampire movie you've ever seen. It plays unlike any other vampire movie you've ever seen. It's so completely of its time and era. And Deneuve and Bowie are ethereal in their beauty and poise. And for that time and that place were the perfect vampires. There's that sex scene. Slap bang in the middle of the movie between Susan Sarandon and Catherine Deneuve, which I believe caused uh, quite the flapping of lips at the time because there were no body stands in. It was these two women. But this um, is a there's a rich tradition of vampirism and lesbianism stretching uh, back to my knowledge, at least Sheridan Le Fanu's novel. Carmilla, published in 1871, uh, 26 years, mind you, uh, before Dracula. Uh, it probably goes back even further than that. I'm sure there are probably, probably someone will be able to give a, a, a thousands of year old uh, ancient Greek example. But uh, from uh, the movies, at least, pretty much all inspired by Le Fanu's novella, which is fantastic, by the way. Uh, you've got Blood and Roses in 1960, uh, uh, Hammer's Karnstein trilogy in 70 and 71, The Vampire Lovers, Lust for a Vampire and Twins of Evil, and you've got uh, Vampiros Lesbos as well in 71. 71 was an excellent vintage for lesbian vampires, but um, this is there's a, there's a pedigree here that can't be denied, and uh, I actually don't think the scene is, is for titillation, uh, Miriam woos her lovers and she uh, cares not whether they're male or female. Uh, she wants people who engage and interest her, who you can genuinely uh, spend centuries with. So why would you automatically discount 50% of the population if you're looking for someone that special? In the end, uh, Miriam takes some of Sarah's blood, gives her some of her own blood, and she starts to change, and she starts to feel the hunger of the title. She offers to show her how to kill, how to feed, and how to live with her to be immortal. And eventually you'll, you'll come to love me for it. And uh, Susan Sarandon has said that what always drew her to the script was the idea of the choice. If you had the choice of being eternally young, but you had to be an addict for the rest of eternity, would you take that choice? And as I understand in the book, as in the film, Miriam chooses not to do that, 
and whilst uh, uh, sorry not Miriam Sarah whilst she's kissing Miriam uh, she takes the little pendant they wear Ankh pendants uh, Egyptian symbols with little blades inside them stabs herself in the neck and kills herself she chooses to kill herself rather than uh, be addicted to blood and hunger for blood and take human lives uh, then the film goes a little bonkers I actually love it Miriam takes Sarah up to her attic where she's going to put her in a coffin uh, all of her uh, exes sort of mummified zombies uh, come back into motion I won't say come back to life because they've always been conscious and sort of uh, uh, attack her she ages, dies, crumbles to dust and they all crumble to dust that's all as it was supposed to be but MGM got a little cold feet and uh, maybe wanted a sequel uh, so they insisted on uh, a final shot of Sarandon's character Sarah still alive in uh, an opulent flat in London with uh, with some beautiful people around her and she had survived and she was the new uh, vampire moving forward. Sarandon says it made no sense, she didn't like it uh, but uh, the money talked uh, and the scene was shot. Uh, there's a lot of discussion online, if you care to look for it, of differences between the book's ending and the film's ending. A lot of people say the film ending doesn't make any sense. I've not read the book yet, so I can only judge by the film. And honestly, I think the film should only be judged by the film. I don't think information from the novel should necessarily inform what you see in the film. And I think there's a perfectly reasonable explanation as to why Sarandon's character survives at the end of the movie. And uh, Deneuve's doesn't. I suspect, and this is, this is my personal reading of the movie that uh, Bowie's character, John Blaylock, doesn't start to age because Miriam's consorts don't have as much longevity as she does. I believe that their longevity and their youth are tied into quite how interested Miriam remains in them as partners. And if her eye starts to wonder, and she starts to become disinterested, even subconsciously, then the ageing process starts. And the more she pulls away from them, the quicker the ageing process gets and there's near the start John is suspecting that she's already got her eyes on a replacement so her her eye is already starting to wonder now if that's the case and uh, these people who remain in her thrall her thralls literally uh, stay for all eternity in coffins calling out her name pining for her, wanting one last kiss. Uh, what Sarah does is she actually breaks that by commit by uh, the act of trying to kill herself. She's the one that rejects Miriam. So it's the same contract and it's the same dynamic but completely the opposite way and uh, they've made the blood contract together so they are bonded but it's Sarah that pulls away from and breaks the bond with Miriam, therefore Miriam dies and Sarah ascends. That's how I read it. And within the context of the movie alone, makes perfect sense as to why Miriam dies and Sarah lives. This film's not going to be for everyone. I think it's absolutely great. It's not something I can put on again and again and again, but once every few years, if I want a little vampire palate cleanser, something a little bit different this one is it this is not the only ancient Egyptian vampire goddess we're gonna meet this month in 80s vampire month uh, it's not even the the only example of a vampires victims uh, resembling zombies more than vampires at the end that we're going to meet but uh, those little bits of similarity aside uh, this movie stands alone in look and feel and honestly 1983 David Bowie, Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon even with a cameo from a young Willem Dafoe as Guy at Phone Booth really what's not to love so all that remains is to give this film its 80s score out of 80 how 80s is this 80s movie out of 80 and I would judge it to be a 
Smoke Machine and Neon, Bauhaus and Bowie, Roller Skating to Iggy Pop, Art House Nudity out of 80. And what that translates to in real terms is that if Miami Vice had been about vampires, it would look like this movie. <laughs>